everyone. Welcome to the Shiro's Project. Um, my name is Malaika and I'm the Director of Operations um, here at the Shiro's Project. And I'm so excited to be interviewing Karen Caitlin today um, for her work as being an author and a public speaker. So thank you so much for coming in today. Um, so I have so many questions to ask you and I'm really excited to kind of dive into your professional journey. Um, so can you just tell us a little bit about how you got started in your career and where you are right now? Sure. Oh my gosh. It's a pleasure to be here and to meet you, Malika, and, um, record this podcast with you. And, um, so a little bit about my career and how I got started working in, um, in tech to begin with. So I, first of all, I worked in tech for 25 years before starting a second career, which I can tell you more about. So anyway, just to set context, it was a long time ago when I started my career. And I got advice at the time, um, actually when I was still in high school and I was applying to college and trying to figure out what I even wanted to major in, I, I really didn't know. And the advice at the time was from my dad who pointed out to me like, hey, Karen, you're I'm always making things. And I was a big crafter, sewer, knitter, all of that type of stuff. You're always making things and you're good at math and you like solving puzzles. And so maybe you'd like to combine all of that together and make software and major in this new thing. And it was new at the time, this new thing called computer science. Um, and so I said, sure, that sounds good. Um, I, I do like all those things. Um, but I had never touched a computer before going to college. I mean, this is a long time ago. We didn't have personal computers. We didn't have computers at home. Um, and a lot of schools didn't have them yet either. So um, it was kind of like, you know, good for my dad for pointing this out. Um, and kind of in hindsight, it was like, what, was, what the heck was I thinking? I was like, you know, I'm gonna pursue computer science never having touched a computer. Um, but I fortunately, did that and loved it. Um, I think so writing software is just really fun and um, I do enjoy it. And that's what I majored in and then started working in tech, you know, after I graduated. Um, and, you know, long story short, in terms of, you know, what happened over 25 years, but I've worked at large companies, small companies, startups. Um, I have worked as an engineer, um, but also as a program manager. Um, as well as an executive. And most recently I was a vice president of engineering at Adobe. Um, so I've seen a lot during the 25 years um, that I was working in tech and, and um, yeah, I don't know if that, I hope that answered your question and it wasn't too long of an answer. No, um, that was perfect. So thank you for that answer. And I think for me, that's really interesting because as someone who is going into my senior year, the idea of a, a cut in stone kind of career is very daunting. Um, and I, I'm really excited to get to talk to you more about your professional journey and why you decided to switch career paths a little bit later in our conversation. But I really love how you brought that up because you are now an author and you started off in computer science. So can you tell us a little bit about what made you choose to switch your career path? Was there a specific incident that triggered this switch for you between a career in STEM and now a speaker and an author? Yeah. Um, you know, there was a specific incident, I'll call it, or a, a, a catalyst where I went to my first Grace Hopper celebration. And it was a small little conference at the time. It was maybe a thousand people. It, of course, has grown substantially since then. Um, but I went and my eyes were open to this whole conversation that was happening around the lack of gender diversity in tech and what different companies were doing to address it with like mentoring programs and various other things as well. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I had no idea this conversation was happening. And as I looked around, I'm like, oh yeah. And I was at Adobe at the time, like at Adobe, we do have a very male dominated workforce. And so I returned from that Grace Hopper thinking, oh my gosh, I have a role to play as the most senior woman on the engineering side of the company. I have a role to play to support women at this company. And so I started our employee resource group, which a lot of tech companies have now, um, employee resource groups, either for women or for um, other underrepresented demographics. But I started the one for women. 
And I started mentoring a lot of women, putting the word out that I was available for mentoring women employees and just looking out for women in the various like leadership meetings I was in as we're planning a you know internal conference. Like, let's make sure there are women who are speaking and not just have it all be um, male and pale guys. Um, so anyway, doing that kind of advocacy work, mentoring work, looking out for career development for women, just doing that for a few years, in addition to being a VP of engineering, it's like, you know what, I want to be doing all that work supporting gender diversity full time, um, and not do the VP of engineering work anymore. So I took a big risk with my career and pivoted to become a leadership coach, a leadership coach for women who work in tech. Um, I don't want people, I don't want women to drop out of this wonderful industry if that's where they want to be and I want to help them grow skills. Um, so along the way, though, of course, as you're building a new business and looking for clients and getting out and meeting people, um, I met someone who I ended up partnering with who had a company at the time called Femgineer. Her name's Purnima Vijay Shankar. And Purnima and I started running meetups together and teaching online classes on different topics and realized that public speaking was this incredible opportunity that was being missed by a lot of women in tech. Um, public speaking is like, we, we always like to say, it's like a multivitamin for your career in that when you speak in public, whether that is giving a, you know, a talk at a lunch and learn with your, within your company or speaking at a larger meetup or conference, when you do that, you are sharing your expertise, people take notice, you get visibility, and that can lead to career um, opportunities, um, doors getting open for you that you didn't even know existed maybe. Um, so we started teaching public speaking, doing an online course, and that led us to jointly co-author a book on public speaking for, specifically for people in tech. And it's called Present, A Techie's Guide to Public Speaking. Um, and uh, just to encourage, and it's, it's not gendered, it's really for anyone, but it's, um, we really want to encourage people who are typically underrepresented from the talks that we attend or the conferences we go to, we want to empower those people to do more, more public speaking. Um, and we break it down and hopefully make it easy to get started. That really resonates with me specifically. I did public speaking for six years um, throughout middle and high school. And that was really something that brought me out of my shell um, and really gave me the confidence to go into a career in communications. I'm a journalism major. So that for me was a big uh, part in me to try and understand where I want to go in the future. Um, so I really, really believe in public speaking. So I'm really excited to talk to you about that. Mm -hmm. um, so switching to your books, um, which you have, I think a little logo behind you, um, but your books are titled Better Allies. And I believe you wrote two. Um, so can you kind of tell us what topics they cover and kind of why you decided to write a book titled Better Allies? Yes. So I'm going to get back to my coaching business um, as a way of explaining that. So I started this coaching business, as I explained to you, coach women working in tech. And I love doing that. I love being a coach. Yet I realized early on I had this big problem with my leadership coaching practice. And the big problem was that all of my clients who are amazing, but they were all working in tech companies where the closer you got to the top, to the CEO, to the C-suite uh, people, the closer you got to the top, just the maler and paler it got. Here you hear me using that term again, maler and paler. And I think most companies think that they are meritocracies. Meritocracies meaning that if people, if employees do good work, they'll get ahead on their merits, on their, their accomplishments, on the impact they're having on the business. But most companies in America are not structured that way. The demographics say something else. There might be good diversity at the entry level, but as you move up into leadership roles, it, be, it becomes um, a different story and it becomes more homogenous. Um, and so to truly help my coaching clients be successful, I could coach them and I do, but I also needed to help their companies become more inclusive so that they would become more meritocracies and my clients could get ahead. Um, so literally, like, in, you're going to laugh at me. I'm going to embarrass myself, but you're going to laugh. I wanted to make all of tech more inclusive. 
like big, big orders, just like one person over here, right? But I wanted to try. So to change the world, of course, the first thing you do is you start a Twitter handle. And uh, so over five years ago now, um, I started a Twitter handle at Better Allies. And my goal was to share just these sort of simple everyday actions someone could take in the course of their daily work to be more inclusive, not just for women, but for anyone from an underrepresented group, underrepresented demographic, you know, based on race or ethnicity, sexual orientation and identity, their age um, and their physical abilities. Um, what could someone do to be more inclusive? So I was sharing things on Twitter, just like ideas like, you know, hey, I'm gonna notice when interruptions happen in meetings and redirect the conversation back to the person who is interrupted, something simple like that. So anyway, tweeting, just tweeting a couple times a day. Then I started getting speaking engagements. Um, to, you know, can you come talk about this at our company or at our conference? And since you know, I started doing more public speaking and I love, <laughs> love public speaking based on writing my first book, I would say yes. And then when I was giving talks, people would always ask me, you know, hey, Karen, do you have a book? Because we want more. So for a few years, I was doing these talks, but I didn't have my book yet. And I was like, no, I don't have a book. I don't have a book. Sorry, no book. Well, I did finally write it. And it's the same name as the Twitter handle. It's Better Allies. Um, so that's the, the first book I wrote on Better Allies. And then I also have a follow-up companion called the Better Allies Approach to Hiring. And it's how to be inclusive during the hiring process. Um, I know that you had said that you are, you know, one person. So for you, you thought, well, how much can I change? But I think that the impact from your books and from the work that you've done is so vast. Um, and I think nowadays we need those kind of books that help us really learn how can we be more inclusive. Um, and I think that that is really important in all senses. So thank you so much for that. That's really, really helpful, especially, um, being someone who identifies as a female going into almost every industry that is extremely male dominated. I think that understanding how we can be better allies to everybody, regardless of what you identify as, it, it can be very helpful. Um, so kind of going off of that, have you learned how to overcome challenges in your career and how have you come to these realizations? And if you feel comfortable, um, we would really love if you could share any personal stories of a time that you maybe felt a little challenged or discouraged um, and how you overcame that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Absolutely. Oh my gosh, there's so many times I felt discouraged or I get in my own head that I wasn't the right person to be doing some job or something like that. Um, so many times. Um, here's one. Um, so I mentioned I used to work at Adobe and I joined Adobe through an acquisition. So this happens a lot. Companies get acquired. And so I was working at a smaller company called Macromedia and we were acquired by the larger company, Adobe. Now, during acquisitions, some people are going to lose their jobs because two people at the two companies are doing the same job. And so someone's going to, you know, one person's job is no longer needed. And so that role is reduced and someone, you know, loses their job. Um, and other people get more responsibility because all of a sudden, okay, this team has to be twice as big or, you know, some multiplier than it, bigger than it was. And I wasn't sure what was going to happen to me. And that was fine. You know, if I lost my job, I'd go find another one, you know, that type of thing. But it became clear during, in the months leading up to the final papers being signed and the, the acquisition being completed, it became clear that the person doing my job at the other company was going to lose his job. So there was something going on. I don't know what, what was happening, but he wasn't going to be um, coming forward to the new company. He was going to be um, asked to leave. And I was going to get all of his responsibility, plus all the things I was already doing, plus a few other things that I had never done before. Um, and some of these things, and this is like it got into my head, like who am I to run a, a big department like this? Um, one of them was um, the font design team, which was a heritage of Adobe. It kind of started out with typeface design and beautiful fonts and beautiful um, graphic design. And this team of people who are specialists in this technology and this um, design that I knew nothing about, that was going to be reporting to me, just for example, as well as if many other things. And I got in my head like, I'm not the right person. I've never done this before. 
Now, fortunately, and this is my technique for getting over those times when I do question my own abilities, I have to surround myself with people who are almost my cheerleaders or the people who might push me and, and encourage me. And um, my partner, Tim, is that person for me every time I need him. He And he, I remember a conversation with him. It's like, hey, wait a second, Karen. You do all of these things well. You learn. This is how you learn. This is your track record around learning. And you totally can take this on, on this new role, this expanded role. You can do it. I know you can. And then I was like, oh, but it's going to be so much work. And we have these two young kids. How am I going to do all of that? And he's like, no, we're going to make this happen. And we strategized how to do that. Um, so just for me, that's what I need. I need to surround myself with people who see different things in me, who believe in me, sometimes when I don't believe in myself and, um, and encourage me to do, you know, to take that step out of my comfort zone, which, um, you know, comfort zones are called comfort zones because they're very comfortable. They, you know, it, we tend to stay in them because we like being there. But when we step outside of our comfort zone, take on that new job, take those new responsibilities on, learn something we've never learned before, it's, it's really, um, they say it can be where the magic happens, you know, when we step out of the comfort zone. Um, and I certainly am, am happy that I've done that a number of times over my career. Um, that's, that's really great to hear because I think something that we haven't really heard much about from a lot of uh, women who, who do face a lot of these obstacles is we always hear that having a support system is really important. Um, and I really like that you brought that up because I think for not only just women in any STEM career, but just in general, for everybody, it is really important to have a support system because that support system, whether it be your family, your friends, a significant other, um, your dog or your cat, it, it can be really helpful to kind of have someone give you a better perspective and at least comfort you, like you were saying, um, whenever you need that. So I'm really glad that um, you were able to share that with us because a lot of our followers and listeners, I think that that can be really helpful for. Um, so kind of going off of that, what advice would you give for people and specifically women who feel less comfortable with public speaking and presenting? Yeah, yeah. So there's a Jerry Seinfeld joke that I'm not going to try to tell because I'm no Jerry Seinfeld, but the punchline basically gets to like, um, we have such a fear of public speaking that it actually is bigger than the fear of dying. So that most of us would rather be in the coffin than giving the eulogy. I'm just a little morbid, I guess, but that's, um, I think that's true. We, we as, a, as a society have such a fear of public speaking. And I absolutely love, I mean, you probably did speech and debate. Is that right? When you said you, you did public speaking for six years. Yeah. I love that as a discipline. And if there's anyone who is um, still able to partake in speech and debate in school, do it even though you might be stepping outside that comfort zone, but do it. Um, for those of us who might be further along and that don't have that opportunity anymore or our community or school doesn't have it, um, you still can get started with public speaking. Um, public speaking doesn't have to be, again, like at a huge conference. In a classroom, you can be the person to volunteer to give the update from a team project, for example. Or if you are working in a company, um, sign up to give a short update to your teammates about something you've learned recently. These, these are great ways to get started and it can be five or 10 minutes. It doesn't have to be like an hour long lecture or something. Um, I also hear, heard from people who are teaching assistants. Um, if undergraduates can participate as teaching assistants, again, it's a great opportunity to maybe teach a little something in front of a class that's public speaking as well. Um, so there are lots of opportunities to do this. There are also um, things called Toastmaster and Toastmaster are community driven clubs um, organized usually in within communities, sometimes companies have them and they are a supportive framework basically uh, to practice the craft of public speaking um, over and over again, you know, kind of, you know, every other week or whatever that might be the right cadence. So there are lots of ways to, to get started. But I want to let everyone know too, like, I think most of us are, don't want to do it because we um, are scared. Like, it's like, I, I get that stage fright, those nerves. I just don't want to do it because of that. 
And I want to let you know, like, I used to be there too. Um, I got a piece of feedback soon after I started my coaching business. I was walking with a mentor just to get feedback about starting a business and how to be successful. And she said to me at one point, she said, um, hey, Karen, do you do much public speaking? And in my head, I was like, no, I don't do much public speaking. I don't like it. I get too nervous. I don't think I'm very good at it. And yeah, I've done some of it over my career. Like I had to give, a, you know, lead my all hands meetings. I've spoken at a few conferences, but no, I don't do much public speaking. I don't want to. That's what I was thinking. I was doing all that, that head um, kind of talk. And I didn't say anything out loud though, along those lines, because I realized the reason she was asking, do you do much public speaking is because this could be the way for me to really get the word out about what I was doing with coaching, to share my approach to things and how I thought about different situations that would probably resonate with someone in the audience and they would, might reach out to me to, um, to be their coach or um, to come into their company and talk more or something like that. So I simply told her in the moment when she said, do you do much public speaking? I simply said, you know, I need to do more of it. And what I then did is I set a goal for myself to speak in public once a month. Um, I had to just like get over this fear and just start doing it. It's kind of like jumping into the deep end to learn to swim. Like I just had to do it more. And then I started telling people I knew, like as I was networking or talking with people, it's like, hey, I have this new goal to speak in public once a month. Um, keep me in mind if you hear of anything. Um, and so I started speaking. I started giving small talks at like little meetups. I spoke at a friend's like uh, daughter's high school women in tech club or women in computing club with, in front of three students. It wasn't a big deal, but I was nervous, but I forced myself to do it. Um, and that got me just going. So I think that the opportunity to just practice um, is a big first step to overcoming this um, you know, the, the lethargy or the, um, the, the, the desire to stay inside our comfort zone and not do it. That's really, really helpful. I think even for myself as someone who has done public speaking in the past, experience and practice. Um, I know they always say practice makes perfect. And I, I really do believe that when it comes to public speaking. So thank you. Those tips are really, really helpful um, to hear. So kind of shifting back into your time in computer science and at Adobe, do you feel that the number of women in the technology industry has increased since your time at Adobe? Mm -hmm. um, and if so, what do you think has contributed to the rise of women in the tech yeah. industry? Yeah. So quickly, let's look at the data, the historical data. Um, when I graduated with my computer science degree, and if you're good at math, you're going to be able to tell how old I am now because I'm going to tell you what year it was, but it was 1985. And in 1985, it was this record spike in the number of women getting computer science degrees in the United States. Um, nationwide, it was about 37% of all the computer science degrees went to women the year I graduated. So not like a 50-50 ratio or anything, but pretty decent, 37.5%. And when I was at Adobe and starting the Women's Employee Resource Group and going to that first Grace Hopper celebration and understanding what was going on, it had dipped to a low of about 17% nationwide of women getting computer science degrees. And, um, and the overall number of women also getting the degrees, not just the percentage, but the overall number was going down. So that, that's what historically was happening over about 20 years or so. It has started creeping up and I don't have the data top of like handy right now, I must admit, but it has started creeping back up and it might be, I, I think it's above 20% now, maybe 25%. And um, so it's moving in the right direction. Now, why? That's a good question. Why there are so many things happening. Um, first of all, there's this awareness in our society that we don't have gender diversity in some of these critical things, critical um, industries who, um, and basically that it's so good when we do have diversity because there's so many studies showing that diversity leads to better financial results, more innovation, solving the right problem. I mean, I'll share with, um, with you to illustrate like solving the right problem. You know, when Apple, and this goes back mm, 
roughly five years, but when they first released their health app, um, you know, which is on all of our iPhones, if we have if we're Apple users, their health app, it was like, you know, we, tr we track all the health metrics that, um, that people need, something like some, you know, wonderful statement, marketing statement. We track all the health metrics that people need. Um, but you know what, which health metric they did not track initially? A woman's period, her menstrual cycle. Oh, that wasn't there in the initial. It wasn't there in the beginning. And it took them over a year to come out with an update to that app to include period tracking. So I don't know what the gender makeup was of that team or the product manager who was defining it, but I have a feeling it was pretty male. <laughs> yeah, that I did not know that actually, because I know that a lot of people, especially my age, use the health app, or there are many also now other apps that have come out for period tracking. Um, but I didn't know that that wasn't part of the original construction of the app. It wasn't, it wasn't. So there's just one example of, um, uh, why we want diversity on teams to, to, to create the right solutions. So there's a lot of awareness that diversity is good. And there's also a lot of um, understanding of what we can do to encourage um, young, I want to say young girls, but we'll just say girls, encourage girls to pursue STEM if that's what they're good at and that's what they want to be doing. Um, too much of um, of society here in the US has discouraged women from study or girls from studying STEM. Um, it's too hard. Maybe you want to do this instead, that type of thing. But now we are seeing programs such as um, uh, in school, like making sure that women are encouraged to go to that um, robotics, you know, after school program or giving, giving students choices in classes. Like, yeah, you can to, to solve this problem or just demonstrate that you understand how to do this coding task, you can do something like, you know, build this um, extension to Minecraft or a game of some sort, or you could um, do something that might be more humanities based, such as um, create a, um, an app for people to find COVID vaccines in their community. Um, and you can demonstrate maybe the same um, understanding of the of the coding concept that's being taught, but give people choices so that they can choose what kind of application would resonate with who they are. And I'm not saying that those two things are necessarily gendered, but those choices can really make a difference to uh, making sure that people, you know, anyone feels like, oh, this is for me. This is stuff I wanna be working on. Um, so, so there's a lot of awareness and active programs to encourage um, girls to um, pursue STEM and to stay there. Yeah, I, I, I very much agree with that. I think that um, looking at the pop culture and media right now, um, there is a little bit more of representation, I think, when it comes to showing young girls ex excited about STEM, excited about science, excited about math, um, and looking into careers regarding STEM, because I think that that wasn't really something we saw much of when I was growing up. And so I am really excited that that, that is becoming more mainstream, especially when you were saying, looking at programs, um, after school programs or getting interested in the classes. I think it's really hard if you don't see that in media, in mainstream media, and you feel like, well, well, no one else is doing it. So how can I? And so I think that having that representation, like you were saying, is really important. Yes, um, representation definitely matters, yes. Um, so again, kind of going off of this, what kind of discrimination and exclusivity per se have you noticed in the tech recruiting and hiring process? Um, mm -hmm. And going off of that again, how can companies aim to eliminate this discrimination? Right, right. So um, in the hiring process itself, like let's say you, know, you have a job posting out there and you have a bunch of people applying and then resumes are coming in and all of that. Um, there's bias that can start very quickly if it's not understood, talked about, and mitigated. And so the bias can be, um, you know, looking at someone's name and assuming the gender, and then assuming like, oh, and it may not even be very conscious, but it's unconscious. Like, no, that uh, a woman who, you know, a woman data scientist. No, I've only seen 
effective male data scientist. So I, I don't think she would be right. And then maybe you, you put her, put her if, if it's a female sounding name into a pile of like the, no, we're not gonna pursue these. Or there could be bias in terms of the motherhood bias. If someone has any activities such as um, the treasurer for the local AYSO soccer team, it's like, that sounds like a, a parent, right? And then if it also is a woman, there is a motherhood bias of people thinking and this is well understood and documented by social scientists of thinking, oh, if, um, if that it's a mother, she isn't going to be as dedicated to this job as we need her to be. So maybe, you know, that's not going to happen. Um, there's bias against African-American sounding names, um, uh, which I, I, I don't even know how to describe what that means, but anyway, um, versus very um, Anglo names. And so if, a, if that's another bias that can cause people to just get um, you know, pushed out of the funnel and not even in, uh, considered for an interview. So there are all sorts of ways you can mitigate that, like hiding key information, um, not showing names to people who are reviewing resumes, for example, um, and so forth, so that you remove that bias. You can also just talk to people who are reviewing resumes and mention that these biases tend to exist and just by having them top of mind, most people will then not be uh, not fall into the trap of having that bias. They'll be more aware of their own biases because it's been pointed out and be less likely to do it. Um, so that happens. But then when people are actually being interviewed, their bias can come into play also if, um, if interviews are not structured, if they're more just conversations, like tell me about yourself and, um, and all of that. When they're not very structured, bias can creep in because then if you're meeting with your team afterwards and doing a debrief on a candidate, someone's going to say, you know, I, I just can't put my finger on it. I don't think they'd be the right person. I don't know. I, I think this other person we interviewed is just better. I can't really put my finger on it. All of that's probably code for bias as well um, of some sort. So companies um, who want to prevent that or making sure they have structured interviews. Um, we're going to ask these questions and here's the rubric we're going to use to evaluate people so that it is more of a fair process to, to get through. Um, and many companies are doing these things, um, not all, but it's, um, it's promising as I talk to people that they're doing a lot more. So I'll leave it there. I could, there are many other things I could share, but hopefully that gives you some insight into it. No, that is that is really good insight. Um, I think being on the other end of being interviewed, um, it's really good to kind of get that insight on the interviewer's side of things from a company's standpoint. Um, and I actually, I've never really thought about creating interviews to be more structured or, um, you know, have more detailed questions. And I think that that is something that is taught to my major specifically as a journalism major, when you're doing interviews, when you're hosting interviews, you're always told to pinpoint specific focused questions. Um, and it's interesting to me that that isn't necessarily um, relayed when you're conducting job interviews. So I, de I definitely think that that is a very interesting point. So thank you for shedding light on that. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that you were saying that there's a lot of um, subconscious bias when it comes to the interview process. So Again, connecting to that, how do you think that the current social and political and racial events that are happening in the United States have affected workplace allyship? Do you think that it has gotten stronger or do you think it, it, it plays a more complicated relationship? Mm. What I have seen, and it's heartbreaking to know and tragic that this is happening because of these very high profile incidents in our country, um, but last uh, Memorial Day last May 2020, when George Floyd was killed, that catalyzed, of course, what we all know is the new Black Lives Matter movement um, it, across so many communities. And yeah, people were protesting in support of Black Lives Matter. People were donating money to charitable causes. People were contacting their elected officials, demanding change to you know the police um, police reform and other things. And people were also looking to the workplace and thinking, oh my gosh, I've never thought about the Black experience here, what, how Black employees experience this workplace. Oh my gosh, I have, there's something I have to do. Um, so it was an incident like that that catalyzed a lot of introspection and a desire to learn more about how to be an ally. Um, 
And unfortunately, it just keeps happening. We have these high profile incidents. Um, you know, here it is right now, it's April 16th, 2021 that we are talking. And in the last um, month, we've had so many hate crimes against people of um, Asian descent as well as Pacific Islander descent. Um, started with the murders in Atlanta of spa workers, Asian spa workers. Um, and we're seeing additional um, murders of black youth you know, by police officers. And when these high profile incidents happen, um, tragic, heartbreaking, absolutely, but they catalyze behavior. And all I can tell you, I don't have data backing this up, it's anecdotal, but my phone starts ringing off the hook. Um, and it's like, you know, my virtual phone, but my, my email, like people are reaching out and like, Karen, we want you to come speak about allyship. Our employees want to understand how they can be allies to black employees, to Asian American employees, um, to other demographics as well. And so there is an appetite um, to learn more about this. And I think it is strengthening our, our workplaces um, with every tragedy. And it's, Again, I wish this weren't happening, but the um, but but the positive outcome is there is more of a desire to become an ally. Yeah, um, I completely agree with you that it shouldn't be happening, and it is, like you said, heartbreaking that it is. Um, but if, in some sense, better and stronger allyship and more understanding of what it means to be an ally can be one of the positive, and I think the only maybe positive outcome that happens, that would be amazing um, to kind of see more strong allyship. Because yeah. if that can, like I said, if that can be the, the one positive outcome that comes out of this, and I think the only positive outcome, right, that I think is the best outcome. Um, so my final question for you, um, what advice would you give um, to those who strive to be better allies to their fellow female colleagues, um, and especially to women who are facing exclusivity in the workplace? Mm -hmm. um, oh, that's, we, we have like another hour, right? Because that's how long I talk about this. No. So the First thing is, um, I think that it's important to understand just because you haven't experienced something yourself doesn't mean it's real. So if you are hearing from a woman coworker that she feels she can't get a word in edgewise in a meeting, or that she isn't invited to certain things, or that she is not getting promoted at the same rate as someone else, or whatever, listen. Listen and learn about her experience and don't discount it just because you've never seen it yourself. Um, it's real. Once you listen and learn, then figure out what can I do to support this one person um, in terms of can I redirect a conversation when I, when I see she's interrupted? Can I tell her about and invite her along to the next high profile meeting I get to go to that I've been invited to? Can I um, make sure that she is aware of an upcoming, you know, internal meeting about the job promotion process that maybe she wouldn't know about otherwise. Like you can look for things you can do, but you can also look for um, systemic change that you might be able to institute within your um, company, within your organization. Systemic change such as, um, you know, reaching out to someone in leadership and asking them like, how can we address this, this problem that's happening? You know, can we, um, how can we um, maybe do training on being more inclusive during, you know, our meetings or something like that, that would have more of a, a, an effect across a larger group of people than just your one coworker who might have said something. Um, yeah, so hopefully that uh, helps. Yeah, give some direction. No, that is that is amazing. Um, so thank you so much, Karen, for being a part of the Shiro's program. Um, and we are so excited um, to have heard about your journey. And we really hope that everyone who's able to listen and watch um, gets a little bit more insight into not only your journey, but how they can apply that um, in their own career journey. So thank you so much. Oh, it was such a pleasure. Thank you for having me on the show. Mm -hmm.